Olafemi uh, Taiwo, he is a professor of philosophy at Georgetown University, author of his second book, Elite Capture, How the Powerful Took Over Identity Politics and Everything Else. Uh, Olafemi, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, so let's start with, um, I guess, the, the, the bare basics. Um, what, what is identity politics? And I guess, you know, we can start, uh, or, or, you know, it started at the, uh, uh, at, at a, at the Kambaki, uh, uh, river collective, um, 50 some odd years ago, uh, or at least the idea was developed. Tell us how it was developed and what it's perceived to have mutated into, I guess. So the basic idea, um, as I understand it, um, as the Combe River Collective developed it, was identity politics is just doing politics starting from an understanding of your place in the social world, right? So you can start from the other direction. You can try to understand the whole social world, the whole social system, and do politics from there. But they thought it would be better to understand where you fit into things and then go from there. So whether, you know, it's gender or race or, you know, whatever is salient to you. Um, that's a way that you can start thinking about what your political agendas and priorities are. And as they developed it, that was compatible with starting from there, but getting to working with other people and taking their concerns on board and so on and so forth. You know, all the things that we think of under the heading coalitional politics maybe today. Um, and what identity politics has morphed into for some people um, is something that's kind of anti-coalitional, anti-solidaristic. Like, I'm going to start thinking about where I fit in the social system and where people like me fit into the social system, and I'm going to end there. Like, that's who I'm fighting for. That's what the fight is about, you know, what people like me are going through, so on and so forth. Okay, so, and and let's talk about the 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 critiques of identity politics that exist today uh because they really do come from across the ideological spectrum uh but they are they're, they're different uh, based upon where those people are situated uh, right. on the spectrum um walk us through those different critiques and then uh let's talk about where yours fits in within that spectrum if it does yeah, I, I certainly think it, it fits in the spectrum. Um, I'd say on the far right, you know, you have an opposition to identity politics that is pretty, I, pretty nakedly, I think, just an investment in the way things are going, right? So people who pursue identity politics might want to change things on the basis of understanding the present system as patriarchal or anti-queer or anti-black or something like that. Um, and all those things are just fine to the people on the far right. Um, on the center right and the center, um, I think there's more of a willingness to entertain the idea that something might be wrong systemically with, something might be unfair systemically with how things go but um, they oppose the idea of doing politics from the perspective of any particular way in which the world is unfair, right? So we should have this kind of reflexive universalism. We should start by thinking, no, just, you know, what are the good rules for anybody and for everybody? And then, you know, there's a variety of, criticisms further left than that, I think one of the more interesting ones, um, and one of the ones I'm actually more sympathetic to, um, is the criticism from what you might call, just to caricature it, the class reductionist left, right? So you're talking about all these kinds of identities, um, all these kinds of oppression, racism, sexism, uh, queer phobia, all these things. Um, but really there's a particular kind of oppression that is more important that gets left out of the story of most of these other identity politics. And that is the kinds of oppression that is linked to capitalism as a system and or class identity as a way of being. Those aren't the exact same thing, but they're similar. 
Um, and so that's what we should focus on instead of identity politics. And, you know, I, I think mine is probably the closest to that last one. Um, but I think, you know, any ver any way of thinking of capitalism worth having is going to notice um, that the thing that organizes our economic system is also the thing that organizes all of the other kinds of oppression. Um, and so that's why I think identity politics is still valuable, even if you thought that there was something particularly special about class or about capitalism as um, an aspect of how the world is put together. And, and so, and just, uh, and, and, and just going uh, back over uh, those, in terms of the right, it, it seems to me that it really is just an argument of they don't have a problem with identity politics as much as they do with which identities are uh, maybe ascendant in our yeah. politics, right? I mean, like it's they've been the the right has been practicing identity politics. It seems to me since the founding of the country. It's just that it has been so overwhelming, and it's been they've had such an exclusive uh, control over the terrain that nobody realized it, or or I should say. Not nobody, obviously, uh, those people who have been marginalized and excluded, but it was never um, it was just that's just normal. That's just like oxygen. The fact that white identity politics would dominate. Um, and so it's really it's not so much identity, but they, they couch it as if this is a new phenomenon. It's just really yeah. there's different players on the field now, as it were. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I mean, for much of the last few centuries it's just been naked domination of uh, some identity groups over others you know i'm older than the end of formal apartheid in south africa right um you know it was just a few decades before that that a lot of civil rights legislation passed for most of u.s history for most of the history of what we would now think of as the world the last 500 years or so um, apartheid, you know, segregation, explicit formal privileges and rights for some particular kinds of people over others has just been, you know, oxygen, as you put it, right? It's just been the way that things went. Um, and I, I think there's not been a real change on the far right as far as thinking that that's, you know, um, not something to go for right that's still the way that they think the world should run it's just now you're the moral etiquette of the day doesn't let you come out and say that so you right. say a bunch of other things and, and and in terms of the center like what are they and i get as you uh, as you describe it and i think there is uh, i attribute to them uh maybe maybe a little bit more good faith in their but the what are they ignoring when they um, say that we should just, I mean, it's almost as if they're saying like, we should have a colorblind and a gender blind society is almost, and anything else um, is, you know, almost like, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, reverse discrimination on some level. Right. Like what are they missing conceptually uh in that assessment of what's going on one of the big things that they're missing um aside from the obvious thing which is just naivete about how that would actually go right you know how how fairly will rules be applied right there's just a, a unwillingness to learn from policing and mass incarceration and all these kinds of things that clue us into what colorblindness means in practice but i think even if you could get a system that would really genuinely apply rules in a quote unquote colorblind and fair way. I think a big thing that is missing from the centrist picture is just what the accumulated weight of the last 500 years means. Right? You know, it, it's the, you know, it, some people are starting essentially with a 400 year head start in terms of the kinds of cultural networks they have access to, the kinds of money they have access to, the kinds of um, 
knowledge that has circulated among other people about how to deal with them, even what language you speak affords you immense opportunities, what country you were born in affords you immense opportunities, and where you were born in that country's hierarchy. All those things are inextricable from just all the hierarchies and inequalities of yesterday. And and then we should say, and that, that 400 years, I mean, that that is a... a that speaks to the durability of these structures um, in, in terms of going forward. You have, um, you know, similar, at least analogous in some respects when it comes to to gender and to um, uh, sexual orientation that may or may not be as um, uh, durable in some respects um because of you know the, it's it's nuanced in that way but it, the you know but the dynamic is similar in terms of these things carrying forward i think only recently did we just have a supreme court ruling uh that impacted the ability i think it was uh, of employers to fire uh someone because they're gay i mean mm -hmm. just that was their own and that was uh, that, that's maybe months old if if anything um all right. So be that as may. So we and, and then on the um, what, when we talk about the critique from the um, uh, the left, as it were, in terms of or what you would say is a, a bit of a caricature, but the class reductionist. Um, uh, so um, we're, we're talking about people essentially saying the priority should be class in when assessing this. And sometimes uh, what is problematic with that is that it's not just priority, but it seems to sort of like completely eliminate another dynamic that may be at play, even if it emanates from the same capitalist uh, structure uh, that exists. All right, so with that sort of, you know, somewhat remedial, but, but I think it's important everybody's on the same page uh, on all these things. Um, um, you are closest to that uh, that that uh, what you call the class reductionist uh, critique, but but how is it different from that critique? So one of the main differences is just the thing that you were kind of gesturing towards at the end there. So so it's it's one thing to say that there's a particular importance that class um, and labor and the kinds of things that are most squarely built into capitalism um, have in challenging the world. Um, and it's another thing to say that those should take kind of exclusive focus or even primary focus in terms of challenging how our social structures work. Um, over the years and decades that followed the Second World War, a lot of the biggest changes to the world structure, politically and economically speaking, were won by nationalist movements. Many of these were led by people who were exclusive, who were um, very, you know, serious Marxist Leninists, but some of them weren't. Um, and it just turns out that, you know, what you need to get people together to move and to fight for one another may be different from, you know, what a social scientist would use to explain um, how it is that they will succeed or fail or, you know, what particular variable it is, you know, whatever it is that people are responding to politically, um, if it is aligned with justice or even potentially aligned with justice seems like something that should be taken seriously. Um, let's uh, speak about your, the, the, what you call deference politics as we, as we move forward and, 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 and sort of, um, discuss how sort of the original concept of identity politics you feel has been hijacked on some level. But um, what what is deference politics? Um, so there's a closely related kind of way of thinking or genre of thought to identity politics, and that's something people call standpoint epistemology. And it basically just means it's not just that who you are and where you stand in society um, should be a place that you start from in figuring out your political agenda. But also when we're thinking about knowledge, who knows things, who has insight into how things work, we should also pay attention to that. And standpoint epistemology, 
that thought that where you are affects what you know, I think is just right. Um, but there's, there's the question from there, how do you put that into practice? What do you do with that realization? And what some people have done is just say, well, what I'm going to do is defer, right? In general, I'm going to find a person who is of the right kind of social position, the right kind of oppressed group, um, who, or may, maybe who has the right kind of social experiences. And whatever that person's political judgment is, is going to become my political judgment. And I think the motivation behind that is a good one, but I think that's um, the kind of way of sifting through politics that is very easy to game by power structures. And if we just think about how our power structures work, it would be extremely unlikely that they wouldn't kind of distort that kind of process. Who are rich people going to put on TV? Whose books, whose ideas are they going to circulate? Are they going to be the ones that genuinely challenge the status quo, or are they going to be the ones that more often than not reflect interests that they have, or at least are compatible with interests that they have? Um, that's the more likely option, I think. And so we can't be sure that the particular oppressed person's opinion that we're getting is really representative. And even if we could be sure of that, that just isn't the question that we should be asking when it comes to knowledge. What is the world like? What should we do? That's not about who's talking, but that's about the world. That's about what we're trying to accomplish. Okay. And so um, did, did deference politics develop distinct from its being uh, employed by uh, uh, the elite, and I want to get, we'll get into d defining the elite in a moment. But did it did it develop distinct from uh, its um, its uh, I guess um, uh, be, being used by the elite? I, I mean, how was that sequenced? I mean, because if I hear if I understand this correctly, it's basically a turnkey way of for the elite. To sort of uh, shift where the topic is going to head, it's a, it's a one-stop shop on some level for 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 redirecting what might be um, other uh, issues in society on some level. And but what what was the sequencing of that? I mean, did deference politics just simply develop out of a uh, a sense of of folks who were not maybe marginalized, feeling like this is the best that we can do. Uh, I mean, and then it was sort of hijacked on some level or, or, or was it, did it happen simultaneously? I think the first thing to say is just, these are all old questions. You know, how do we know things, which kind of people are in the right kind of position to know? Um, so the terms that we used to describe them might be new, but these kind of, problems and challenges are always, you know, coming in and out of focus as years go by and as societies go through stages of development. Um, as far as and, the and last- I'm sorry, can I just clarify that? So this, on some yeah. level, this could be uh, analogous to an appeal to authority, except yeah. for in, in the context of deference politics, the problem is that the authority may be dubious in terms of what it really speaks for um, and, and whether it's representative and uh, I mean, so that's that's part of the issue there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and as far as you know, the things that have developed since this term identity politics uh, came on the scene in the '70s, um, I think it's I think it's been happening at the same time. So there's a lot of intellectual movements. There's a lot of political movements that are thinking about what to do with knowledge and what to do with authority. And they're all acting at the same time. Some of them are going to be people who are for principled reasons thinking, no, we need to change how we do science. We need to change how we do policies. And we need to make those changes in ways that genuinely affirm that the people who are affected by the science and the policies know things and our current scientific practices fail to reflect that. Right. So there are people who are pushing that line and there are other people who were, you know, 
on the HR committees of various mega corporations who said, you know, if we hire somebody like this and if we put this kind of person in the, you know, commercial for our product and so on and so forth, who have these, you know, less principled, um, more opportunistic ways of thinking about the contribution that identity makes, they were pushing a different line. And over time, which are people going to get more exposed to? Well, the people in group number two have way more resources, money, political reach, social reach than all the people in group number one. And so over time, more and more of our exposure to any version of this thought about identity or standpoint is going to look like what people in group number two are doing. Now, you know, some people are going to look at that and say, well, that is proof that there was never any radical potential of this thought. That's proof that this is co-optable. Um, but from where I sit, that's just proof that identity politics is like everything else in a society that is structured to allow the people with the most money, resources, and social position the best opportunity to develop anything that they choose to develop. So uh, we're we're looking at multiple variants of let's say uh, of 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 this idea of identity politics, and um, because we live in a society that is dictated by where 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 capitalists have the power, um, it it essentially has there's a sort of a natural selection uh, that's taking place of some yes. sorts, and so the variant that is most um, suited uh, or suitable for the capitalist class, as it were, essentially the elites, as you describe them, um, that's the one that is going to uh, succeed in society, or at least, I guess, survive or, uh, yes. you know, or replicate, if you will, um, to use my sort of uh, this analogy. Um, so let's talk about who the elites are. Are we talking about... I mean, you, you say HR, you say corporations. Um, are we just basically talking about the capitalist class or, uh, or, or is, there another, is there another way to define the elites? Yeah, I mean, you could say the capitalist class plus. Um, you know, I think the basic thing that I'm trying to point out is that there are different kinds of domains of social life. Um, the domains of production, um, domain of the military, where maybe some generals of strong militaries are at the top of that chain, the domain of the media, where maybe, you know, Fox News types are at the top. You know, not all the people at the top of these hierarchies are going to be people who are capitalists. Um, but what characterizes all of them is that they are disproportionately in a position to affect how that sphere of life goes. And they can convert their power at that sphere of life to other spheres of life. Five-star generals are very rich. They get onto corporate boards and so on and so forth. They have political pull. Um, politicians are very rich, so on and so forth, right? So um, there's a at the top of these hierarchies, there's a kind of um, coming together of the people who have power. Um, not every kind of relevant social power in this discussion is the particular power of ownership over the means of production on a private basis, um, but they're relevant to deciding how these social questions go of how we think about particular concepts like identity politics and how those things get discussed would uh would some would 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 some of the capitalist critiques say like you know, well those people were in those positions basically as products of a capitalist system regardless of their stat their their specific status within the, the sort of uh, you know um uh, owning the means of production but rather they were put there as sort of like um they exist there because they don't in any way um, threaten that structure that exists. I mean, is that relevant at all? The, the, uh, that, that, or, or, or? It's true. Um, but, you know, if we believe 
you know, if those of us who are on, you know, the Marxist side of things believe what we say about capitalism, it's also the things, it's also the system that puts everybody else in the positions they're in. All right, so it's so it's not enough to erase the difference between a capitalist and a four-star general or you know a media conglomerate uh, executive decision maker or something, um, but it is you know if the point is just that capitalism is fundamentally explanatory, then that's true. Okay, and so um, let's uh, so what do we do? So if the elite have sort of um, have taken control, as it were, or have manipulated the idea of identity politics and have turned it into that, um, that <clears throat> or have promoted that variant, which basically says on some level, like, we're going to use this as a shield to uh, avoid addressing sort of some of the structural problems. Um, what what uh, what are we to do? What what are the rest of us to do uh, about that? I mean, what is the and, and you, you you get into like essentially you know um, I don't I don't know if I would call it solutions, but a way to address this because you you are I mean you are not advocating getting rid or ignoring the idea of identity politics, right? I mean, this is and I just want to. Maybe you you can uh, uh, clarify that and then take us into what the you know what we should be doing with it. Yeah, so I'm not advocating for getting rid of identity politics. I think the question isn't whether or not we use identity politics, but the question is how to what ends do we um, put identity politics, which is same political question we should ask of any idea that we're using politically. Um, and, you know, this is where my thinking is perhaps, you know, more most orthodox as far as, you know, maybe Marxist thought goes, but you, you basically want to build up the kinds of institutions that actually challenge the power gap between non elites and elites, if you want to fight elite capture, and more importantly, if you want to actually change the way that the world works. Um, so rather than fighting with capitalists over the definition of identity politics and what real identity politics is, why don't we create the kinds of groups and linkages that can fight with capitalists over the terms of working conditions? Right? Those are unions. Um, I have a slightly broader view of this. You know, I think we should be fighting um, about decommodifying water and energy. I think those are also big um, centers of power for particular segments of the capitalist class, and we should want those to be genuinely publicly owned. Um, so decommodification, unions, um, but any kinds of changes that we can make that genuinely make a practical difference to how wide the gap is between elites and non-elites and not an ideological difference. Um, that's more or less the takeaway that I hope people take from the book. Well, I mean, uh, uh, can you tease that out on some level? So where, what do we do with identity politics in that instance? Because, I mean, I think, you know, well, we can espouse the decommodification of, of you know, energy and water and maybe healthcare and housing. Uh, I mean, uh, we could throw that in and that would have and we don't even need to uh, t speak to identity politics. Yeah, we don't need to to explain why those are good things to do. We may need to to get people to do it. All right. So. You know, we're sitting here two years from the summer of 2020, in which a historically unprecedented number of people in the US and across the world, you know, went out and essentially fought to say, you know, we oppose racism. We oppose racism of the particular kind that was on display in the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Tony McDade and so many other people, right? That 
is a level of support and a level of interest and a level of political energy that doesn't exist for any of the other things that we mentioned, as far as I'm aware. And so those of us who understand the contribution that capitalism makes to the systems that killed George Floyd and Breonna Taylor would be better off saying what contributions it made rather than telling people they're wrong for thinking racism is an important thing to be against, right? People who understand what contribution capitalism makes to um, the gendered provision of healthcare would be better off saying in support of people who are fighting for abortion access and for healthcare and gender justice, saying in support of those movements, we support this and we understand, we have a particular understanding of what capitalism has to do with this thing. And we would ask you to support that understanding as well. Um, so basically what I'm trying to say is, you know, there, there should be, um, we should be positioning ourselves as with rather than against these kinds of currents that are way ahead of us political energy wise. So, I mean, uh, I'm trying to think to like, let's say like a Bernie Sanders race um, in, in 2016 and in 2020 to some extent, but particularly 2016, um, where I think his argument would have been something like um, uh, Medicare for all, for instance, or um, is going to um, provide for the most marginalized in society and, uh, and uh, you know, greater than, you know, uh, any type of, you know, uh, I guess, understanding about uh, racial disparities, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and he was criticized for being, I guess, a class reductionist on some level. Like, uh, you know, people would cite that uh, I can be a black man driving a Mercedes making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, millions of dollars a year, still get pulled over by the cops. Like, where does, like, so, and, and you talk about um, uh, constructive politics uh, in, in the book. Like, where, like, how would, how would that application, like, how would you deal with that sort of disparity of perspective on what he's offering? So I think I think it was just, you know, it was just right to say that Medicare for all would address serious racial inequities, serious gender inequities, so on and so forth. Right. That was that was just correct. I think what we're up against is a kind of political culture that has for a variety of reasons, but the left hasn't done itself any favors um, on this issue. But for a variety of reasons, people pitch these against each other, right? So Medicare for all is something you would support instead of supporting something anti-racist, as opposed to being an anti-racist thing that you support. Um, and w part of taking back identity politics um, or trying to assert a version of identity politics that is not at odds with actually solving racism or patriarchy or any of these other things um, would be, I think, for people in both kinds of camps, the... Um, maybe class-centered and maybe other things centered um, political camps to start making it more obvious that those are things that are aligned. And I, you know, for whatever reason, it didn't seem to be obvious to people when Bernie ran those years ago, though I imagine if that happened today, things would be at least slightly different. I, I would imagine too, but 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 isn't there a at the very least on the side of people there is there is at least a significant portion of people who don't want to see that relationship 
Like the, you know, like, I mean, obviously it's the elite, you know, as you yeah. describe them, but you know, they've done a good job of selling that idea down the line and they have a, a far greater sort of access to promulgating that view. Right. Um, I mean, that's the, the point, like how, how do, and, and I think on some level there was an attempt by some, and, and I'm just using this as an example because it's the most sort of like obvious, I guess, real world example we have to promote that idea that th this is that Medicare for all is a um, is anti-racist on some level and is um, and is anti-transphobic, uh, one could argue, and uh, and uh, uh, anti-misogynist. I mean, we're, I mean we, we're just have had years, it, it feels like over the past five or six years to sort of uh, manifest that. Um, but what is I, I mean? Is it is it you just you're you uh, as a as a coalition you're just trying to sort of pick off those people who are who ha are uh, who are not trying to weaponize the sort of bastardization of identity politics but rather are maybe uh, open to it I mean is it is it really just a dispositional um, uh, approach that needs to change. It's not just a dispositional approach that needs to change. I think it's also, you know, a practical approach that needs to change. Um, so um, one of the one of the points that I've talked about elsewhere. There was a piece that I wrote with a colleague, Enzo Rossi, um, and and we were talking about this kind of targeted universalism, right? Where you don't just say well, it's Medicare for all and trans people are part of all. And so they're going to get Medicare, right? What, what you say is here's how specifically groups of people that are targeted and stigmatized are going to be part of this vision that we're rolling out. And so we don't just include them as a grammatical default, but there is, but the universalism we're interested in is one that responds to specific people's circumstances and doesn't homogenize them, right? I think that's the kind of universalism that we need to apply in general. And unions have historically been some of the institutions that have done this most effectively, where we are in a union and we are all bargaining for a contract and we all want a wage increase. Um, but we are also bargaining together for specific sexual harassment policies, for instance, so that people who are targeted by harassment um, aren't targeted by harassment. That's not something that necessarily everybody in the union worries about, but as a union, we are bargaining for this particular demand. And so, you know, we often portray these particular kinds of problems that marginalized groups have as if they are incompatible with pushing for things for all, um, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, e extend this, I mean, and I know that you do, but um, uh, for the sake of just this conversation too, this principle uh, of, 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 of a way of approaching universalist uh, policies uh, also extends internationally. W will you, will you, Will you talk about that uh, that extension, or really, it's not really an extension. I mean, it's just part of the same dynamic. Yeah, I think that's right. It's part of the same dynamic, and you know, also again, solidarity between groups across borders has often taken this form. Um, whether we're talking about the transnational organizing in different unions across the world against apartheid in South Africa whether we're talking about um, unions collaborating against war production, refusing to build missiles in Italy or refusing to unload them off docks in California in order to prevent them from being dropped somewhere else in the world, right? These are all things that we can have the disposition to execute, but we actually need 
the organization, the groups of people who are willing to do actions together in order to make any of those dispositions real challenges to the elites who want to build missiles and ship them across the world or enforce apartheid in South Africa or whatever it may be. Um, and so I guess, uh, lastly, what, how to respond to the sort of like the, 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 the cultural complaints. Um, I mean, you know, I, uh, sitting here, so much of what I read, particularly from like, I guess it, you know, I, I the, the, the right is far more, uh, uh, um, it seems to me, um, obvious their critique of, of, of uh, identity politics as it were just because they you know they're mad that they're they're being displaced on some level um but for that that center that talks about you know there are speech codes at oberlin or something you know and and this is uh and uh, i'm going to write my 15th column uh, in the new york times about this and uh i mean like what how to is there i mean is, is there even is it worth even engaging at that level or is it simply a the engagement in and of itself is a distraction from the actual work that needs to take place to further a a coalition yeah i go back and forth on this one you know i think at the end of the day, the good thing about working at scale, you know, working with a lot of people, trying to get a lot of people involved, trying to do mass politics, is that you can't afford to really walk and chew gum. You know, if somebody has it in them to try to convince people that cancel culture isn't the biggest threat to humanity. It actually, maybe it's ecological collapse. Um, you know, more power to them. Uh, I don't think I have that in me myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very tired. I have other things to do. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it, it's just a question of focus at movement level. Right. So, so do we see these culture war battles um, of the chattering class as kind of primary? And, and not just do we consciously see them as primary, but do we find ourselves constantly in reaction to what's happening at that level of discourse in those channels? Or do we have the social, political, and emotional discipline to keep our eye on the ball. Um, and if we have that, then there's space to have those fights while we're also trying to decommodify water and energy, while we're also trying to fight back against evictions, while we're also trying to get health care to everybody. What well, What is the relationship between the fact that, I mean, I, I, I guess, I, I mean, I may have been exaggerating with the 15 columns thing, but uh, I mean, what is the relationship between the elites who, you know, I think if you, if you uh, hand out who gets column space in the New York times or in any, uh, you know, major publication or, or television, I mean, what you are uh, definitionally elite, I think. Mm -hmm. um, what is the relationship between that and the sort of the critique of because cancel culture is sort of the flip side of of um i guess you know white fragility on some level right i mean uh, they're both working the same coin on some level um what is what what is the value to the elite of that of of basically putting i don't know both both teams on the pitch, as it were. I, I really think it's distraction more than anything else. You know, th that's not to say that the people who are writing those columns don't believe themselves. You know, right. if, they, if they didn't believe themselves a little bit, it would be hard to go past column 11, 
you know. I would imagine. And, I know yeah. I'm quite convinced that they believe it, I, but but yeah. they're not the ones who hire themselves. Exactly, exactly. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not that conspiratorial in general, but I really think, you know, with the cancel culture debate in general, uh, I, I really just find that to be an astonishing achievement by the U.S. elite. <laughs> like breathtaking achievement you know in the context of our total impunity culture which is in fact what is operating at the elite level you know i'm not even talking about the scores of i'm not even talking about epstein i'm not even talking about the scores of harassment and assault allegations against so many elite people who um are getting this message out but even at the level of straight up war crimes, you know, there were there was invasions launched in Iraq and Afghanistan for reasons nobody even pretends to remember, much less defend. Uh, and there have been no consequences whatsoever for this. So, you know, if the elites have been able to get us thinking about our culture of responsibility and to center that discussion on whether or not the cafeteria is serving the right kind of food at some random college that is an unbelievable that is a world historical achievement by the elite class of today yeah I, back. I i agree with you it's it's pretty impressive uh that they have been able to sort of the idea of cancel culture being a uh a anything of a significant uh problem in our society as we look around and it's uh been a hundred degrees out for, for for four weeks and uh there's wars uh, i mean it 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 is fascinating um it's uh uh, uh, uh really appreciate uh your work and, and your coming on uh and we will put a link to elite capture how the powerful took over identity politics and everything else uh, at a majority .fm. Uh, Olafemi uh, Taiwo, professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. Thanks so much for coming on. Really do appreciate it. Thanks a lot.